You know, I never, ever, 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 never, ever liked the movie Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if it was the animation style. I don't know what it was. Uh, I know the drug culture in the 60s got behind it, which maybe is why I didn't necessarily like it. Uh, there, there may be things there that I don't, I don't fully understand. But regardless of my opinion about the movie, it's definitely a classic animated film. Of course, Disney doing what Disney does has tried to bring it into kind of the, the contemporary moment and they've made versions of it. I think the Queen of Hearts is in Disney's new villains uh, stuff and so they've tried to, to make this relevant for a new, new audience, which, uh, you know, for what it's worth. Uh, and it gets very mixed results. But as villains go, the Queen of Hearts is certainly an interesting lady. According to the Disney Wiki, so there is a, a Disney wiki, if you were curious. Uh, it says this, The Queen of Hearts is the tyrannical and deranged ruler of Wonderland with a sadistic penchant for beheadings. When Alice arrives in the kingdom and inadvertently humiliates the monarch, the Queen of Hearts becomes obsessed with decapitating the girl. It's all kid-friendly, right? All the residents of Wonderland are insane in some way, but the Queen of Hearts is the most dangerous of them all by being the ruler of the land. She is very egotistical, and she likes to hear the words, yes, your majesty, and insists that all ways are my ways. She's also known to be a rather childish character, even in the face of Alice, as she is incredibly impatient, irrationally sensitive, prone to temper tantrums, and is stated above, rather egotistical. Of course, it's very difficult, very rare even, to find a queen without a, without a king, and you met the king of hearts in the clip there, the uh, rather diminutive figure hiding in the shadows of his, uh, his wife. And he doesn't exactly project a particular kind of authority that you would expect from a king as he shuffles out seeking recognition and shuffles out to help identify Alice. In an age where we are concerned about toxic masculinity, you can rest assured that Disney will not be slapping that warning label on this film as they have slapped warning labels on so many other films from that, from that era. What if I told you, though, that the Queen of Hearts has actually been around for some time? Not just since the 1951 classic animated film, not just since the 1865 book on which the film was based, Lewis Carroll's book, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I believe we actually encounter something like the Queen of Hearts in the pages of the Old Testament. Now, I certainly don't believe that Lewis Carroll intended any parallels to scriptures when he wrote the original novel, but I do think we will find some very interesting connections between the Queen of Hearts as we have just been introduced to her and actually the goddess that we learn about in Jeremiah chapter 44. When we pick up our story from last week, we find out that the remnant that's been left over from Babylon, they've ignored all of the warnings that have been given to them and they have moved into Egypt. God said not to go to Egypt. They made a beeline for Egypt. God told them not to commit idolatry. And what are they doing in Egypt? None other than committing idolatry. And they've even returned to an old favorite in terms of their religious devotion. We met her before all the way back in Jeremiah chapter 7. The Bible calls her the queen of heaven. But for the Israelites, she may as well have been known as the queen of our hearts. If you've got your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 44, drawing to a close this book, but uh, we will stop here in 44 for just a few moments this morning. I would invite you to stand if you're able in honor of the reading of God's word from Jeremiah 44, beginning there in verse 15. Then all the men who knew that their wives had made offerings to other gods and all the women who stood by a great assembly all the people who lived in Pathros in the land of Egypt answered Jeremiah, as for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. But we will do everything that we have vowed, make offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we did both we and our fathers, our kings and our officials in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then... We had plenty of food, and we prospered, and we saw no disaster. 
But since we left off making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out our drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And the woman said, when we made offerings to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, was it without our husband's approval that we made cakes for her, for her bearing her image and poured out drink offerings to her? And then Jeremiah said to all the people, men and women, all the people who had given him this answer, as for the offerings you offered in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your officials and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them? Did it not come into his mind? The Lord could no longer bear your evil deeds and the abominations that you committed. Therefore, your land has become a desolation and a waste and a curse without inhabitant as it is this day. It is because you made offerings and because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey the voice of the Lord or walk in his law and in his statutes and in his testimonies that this disaster happened to you as as at this day. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the challenging texts like this one that call us to even fundamentally question how we, how we view the world and how we view creation around us. Lord, I pray that we would recognize uh, the, the lure of idolatry in our day and time and fight against it in our own lives. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We've got a challenging sermon ahead of us here, and so I want us to Buckle up. But one thing I would say as we tackle some challenging ideas and some challenging themes, listen to all the things. Don't listen to one thing and then be frustrated by one thing and not listen to all the things because sometimes we do that with challenging texts. We hear, uh, we hear till we're triggered and then we don't listen anymore. So we need to listen to all the things and hopefully we will come away with appropriate understanding of what's happening here in Jeremiah chapter 44. It is widely believed that these are the prophet Jeremiah's last words. And it's good for us to note when we are encountering someone's last words because last words tend to carry more significance, don't they? If you have a loved one who is, who is dying and that loved one calls you in to speak, you're going to cherish those words. I know many people have a voicemail on their phone from a deceased loved one. It's the last message that they have recorded and they don't ever want to delete that voicemail because of the significance that those words often carry. It's difficult to know exactly when these words were spoken in chapter 40 but it is clear from the first verse of chapter 44 that this is sometime after the remnant from Judah has arrived in Babylon. They had already begun to spread out. They were no longer a concentrated group. The first verse indicates that they've spread out among other cities along the river Nile. Of course, this didn't stop Jeremiah from doing what Jeremiah did best, proclaiming the word of God to a people who desperately needed to hear it. In what has to be one of the most consistent themes of the Old Testament, these people never learned. They heard the same sermon over and over again, and they never learned. They continued to go back to the old patterns, the old ways, the old idolatry that they were continually warned of. Of course, there were moments of revival that we know about, but invariably, the people of God did everything in their power to avoid serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for the long haul. And here we are in Egypt, after Jerusalem has been destroyed, the remnant has fled the the land, and that pattern hasn't changed. It takes on new innovations, it looks a little bit differently, but the remnant of these Jewish people were drawn into the worship of a goddess known to Jeremiah as the Queen of Heaven. Now, She wasn't an Egyptian goddess. This wasn't like they picked up some Egyptian goddess along the way. We know that the queen of heaven is well known in that region. She was a fertility goddess worshiped by the Canaanites and the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And the Jews didn't really care where their deities came from. When they worshiped idols, they weren't necessarily concerned about where they picked them up from. In different countries, she was known by different titles. She was known as Anat, Astarte, Ashtaroth, and Ishtar. Different names, same idol, same devastating consequences. One of the things that we know about goddess worship, though, one of the things that we understand about this is that goddess worship empowers women in particular with the deity that they can create in their own image. Now, don't be offended because men are perfectly acceptable at creating gods in their own image as well. So don't be offended by that, ladies. Men are just as guilty. 
But goddess worship in particular says, here, you can have a God that's crafted, a goddess that's made after you. It's in your image. It's in your likeness. And we know throughout history there have been various cults and various religious entities that have been oriented towards goddess worship, particularly as we see here in chapter 44. Of course, we know the religion of Wicca, witchcraft, and all of that. That is very much a, a religion that is geared towards the worship of, of nature as a, as a female sort of goddess. There are even some forms of Roman Catholicism that esteem the mother of Jesus to a type of co-redeemer status where, where they will pray to Mary as if Mary is, in, is involved in our salvation. If you've ever been to Mexico and other uh, developing countries where Roman Catholicism has a stronghold, you will frequently see shrines on the side of the road with a figure of the Virgin Mary in those shrines. And if you look at those shrines, you will find that there are people who are burning candles and burning incense and making offerings, and they are actively worshiping at a shrine that is not devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, but is actively devoted to the Virgin Mary. I don't know what you call that, but if it looks like an idol and smells like an idol, it's probably an idol, okay? Now, I'm fully aware that I'm about to walk into a cultural minefield, but this is something the scriptures are not silent on, therefore we can't be silent on it either, even if the prevailing voices of the world today don't really want to hear what the Bible has to say about this. I want you to hear me correctly. When we read the scriptures, God makes himself known to us in masculine form. Now that God's spirit, so we understand that, that it doesn't, God doesn't have gender in the way that we would think. Of course, the Son of God made himself manifest as a physical male being, but God refers to himself as Father. God refers to himself with male pronouns. God refers to himself in the masculine form. He is forever known as the King of Kings, not the Queen of Kings. Queens. God makes himself known to us in a masculine form. Attempts have been made to change God's revelation of himself into something else. People will point to scriptures where, where God likens himself to a mother caring for young. That's not God saying he is a mother. He is simply likening the care that a mother provides and saying, I will care for my children in the same way. That is not the same thing. There are many in more liberal denominations that will try to refer to God as something as Father, Son, and Spirit. And they will eliminate the masculine terms of the Trinity and replace those, those masculine words with feminine words. It's not uncommon to go into some liberal churches where you might hear it be referred to as Mother, Son, and Holy Spirit. You'll hear those sort of things, and if that bothers you, it should because that's not how God has made himself known to us. And if you are referring to something other than how God has made himself known to us, then I don't know who you're talking about anymore because it's not the God of the Bible. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who has made, him, made himself known to us in masculine form. But you need to understand something. This has been a battleground from the very, very beginning. This is not something that's new. We go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and the first two books, the first two chapters of the book of Genesis, and we encounter that God has very made, been very specific in his creative work. And one of the things that stands out in God's creative work is that there is order in creation. There is order in the way that God put things together. We, this is not hard. There is light and there is darkness. When it's bedtime, I'm thankful for the order of light and darkness. And when it's time to get up the next day, I'm thankful for light breaking forth the dawn. And I'm thankful that that order has happened consistently and will happen consistently until there is no more darkness. There is order. I'm thankful that we have sea and we have dry ground. This is not Kevin Costner in Waterworld. So I'm grateful that we have dry ground on which we can live. I don't mind going to the sea and I don't mind eating the fruit of the sea. But I'm grateful that there is order and that there is dry ground. I am grateful that there are plants growing where plants belong. I'm grateful that there are fish swimming where fish belong. I'm grateful that there are birds flying where birds belong. There is order in the cosmos. But not only is there order in how it's put together, there is order in how life works. You have male and female. God says in the very beginning, in the beginning he created them male and female. In male and female, he created them. Life is designed by God to beget life. 
That is God's good order. That is God's good design. And I know that that's unpopular today, and I know that this could get us canceled on YouTube and Facebook, but that is God's good design, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not accidental. It is by God's sovereign decree and his absolute design. And even in the creation of male and female, you have a separation of duties. In spite of our ridiculous confusion in 2024, the female is uniquely designed for childbearing and child rearing. This is not bad, this is God's good design. We've been blessed in our church with some new infants lately, and it's good to see that God has created male and female with specifics in mind. The male is uniquely designed to protect and provide for the needs of his family. That's not to say that women can't provide or protect. I can promise you, ladies, I know what a mama bear looks like, and I'm not talking about the one you find in the woods. One of the most terrifying things you can encounter is a female grizzly bear separated from her young, but one thing more terrifying than that is a mama human being who is in mama bear mode. She is, she's perfectly capable of protecting. Don't try her, you'll find out the hard way. But creation order says this. Are you ready? Male and female are equal in worth but unique in function and purpose. And that makes us public enemy number one to the prevailing wisdom of this age. Male and female are equal in worth. Ladies, there is not a one of you in the room who is less valuable than any man in this room. And I hope that we communicate that. We recognize that there are differences in labor and differences in purpose and differences in design, but there is no difference in value and worth. The Son of God paid the price for your sins in the same way that he paid the price for the sins of any man sitting next to you. Just as valuable, just as worthy. But listen, there is a reason that men should not compete in women's sports. And as much as people want to cry out today about injustice and inequality, we all know deep down in our hearts that that is true. This isn't patriarchal. It's not chauvinistic. This is God's good design, and we call this creation order. And when God made things in creation, he looked at everything that he made, and how did he declare it? It's good. It's good. God said it was good. Creation is good. God was pleased with his work. God was pleased with the relationship that he established between mankind and creation. God was pleased with the relationship that he created between male and female. God was pleased with the relationship that he established between humankind and God. He was pleased with those things and he looked at all those things and said it is good. But we get no further than the third chapter in the Bible and things go haywire. The wheels come off. What happens? The serpent shows up. We know the serpent to be the devil. He's made manifest as an animal. He takes charge of the situation. Whoop, whoop, red alert, red alert. The serpent's not in charge. He was not given authority. He was not given dominion. He was to be subject. This would have never happened if God's order had been respected by humankind. The serpent was under the, under the dominion of the man and the woman. The serpent had no authority other than what they allowed him to have. The woman was led into temptation by the serpent. The serpent talked to the woman first, made her a compelling offer. And in the offer, the woman saw an opportunity to be equal to God by eating of the fruit she saw the opportunity, I get to be like God? I mean that God is in my image, not the other way around? I get to be like God? And then the man, what's he doing? He's watching from the sidelines. He failed completely in his responsibility to his family. He wasn't there. He wasn't at home mowing the lawn. He, he was right there. He had a responsibility to speak up. Honey, you don't speak to the snake. He had a responsibility to say, the snake is not in charge. 
He had a responsibility to, to protect, and he failed in his primary function. He was complicit in the whole thing, and we've been working through this mess ever since. The king established order in creation, and with a solitary act, that order was completely upended. Serpent exercised authority over humans. Female exercises authority over male. Both male and female attempt the coup of the ages by reaching for equality with God, something that they could not grasp. And since the fall, we have struggled with regaining the order that God established by creation. And now we have all these pendulum swings of trying to find the order that's supposed to be here. We have all these these attempts to find order. You have male chauvinism. And I do believe there's such a thing as toxic masculinity. I think that's real. Now, I wouldn't define it the same way cultural progressives define it. If I hold the door for a lady, that's not toxic masculinity. We call that in the South what? Courtesy being polite, showing kindness. It's not toxic masculinity. If you like to go hunting or fishing, that's not necessarily toxic masculinity. If you're squishing beer cans on your head while you're doing it, we might be talking about something then. That's one pendulum swing, but then we have the other pendulum swing, which is, which is radical feminism that attempts to ignore the fact that there are differences between the sexes. Again, seeking equal pay for equal work is not radical feminism. That's fair. But we need to be honest. There are some jobs that pay more than others. And that's not necessarily inequality. That is the cultural progressive's number one argument for abortion. Women have to have equal right to be non-pregnant as men do. That is their number one argument. But the reality is it simply isn't true because it ignores the foundation and it ignores the creation order as God has given to it. There's only one sex that can have babies. That's it. You can't invert the argument. Men do not have an equal right to be pregnant as women do. You can say it doesn't make it true. And then you have this entire spectrum of the LGBT movement, which is the logical conclusion of the rejection of creation order. Paul, in Romans chapter 1, paints an argument with incredible clarity. No one can refute him because he's speaking inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's a brilliant argument. It's a brilliant refutation for what happens when you reject creation order. You end in a logical conclusion. You reject God as creator and you reap the harvest of confusion that we live in today. And as we watch this current cultural moment unfold, if anything, it is not characterized by order, it is characterized by chaos and disorder. Again, you need clarity? Go read Genesis 1 through 3 and go read Romans 1, and God will give you clarity. Christian marriage seeks to restore the creation order, however. Christian marriage seeks to restore the creation order. How? How? Husbands loving their wives with the sacrificial love of Jesus. That's not toxic masculinity. Show me a godly woman who would be irritated if her husband loved her with the sacrificial love of Jesus. Hey, she doesn't exist. She doesn't exist. I can promise you that the women in this room would love if their husbands love them as Jesus loves. No one's gonna argue that. Wives joyfully submitting to the Christ-like love of their husbands, not oppressively, not being forced to, but joyfully submitting to the Christ-like love of their husbands. Children held in proper priority. Children are not the most important thing in your family. Your marriage is the most important thing in your family. Children are important. They're not the most important thing. And pets, uh, hold on. (laughs) Being treated as pets, not as children. You can love them. You can care about them. They're not your kids. They're, They're animals. And they are in a certain order in creation. Now, is this perfect? No, man, this is crazy. It's fraught with trouble because sinners are involved. You get sinners involved and and order goes out the window. But this is the best scenario in this fallen world. This is the ideal that God has given to us. And if the church is not promoting this ideal, then I don't know what we're promoting. And I'm not ashamed of this. It doesn't offend me at all. 
to proclaim what the Bible says is the ideal for how families and how churches should be put together in this fallen world. Now, of course, all this is temporary. One of the chief characteristics of the new heaven and new earth is a restoration of order. In the restoration of order, God is at the center of everything. Mankind is joyfully gathered to celebrate the king on his throne, and all of creation is restored as it's intended to be. Now, with that in mind, draw your attention back to our villain in Wonderland, the Queen of Hearts, her unreasonable authority over her dominion. And hiding in her shadow, the anything but masculine king of hearts. Probably his number one job, his one, number one aspiration is what? To hope that he can avoid the fate of everybody else in the kingdom. He simply wants to keep his head attached to his shoulders. But isn't this the problem? This was 1951, and and knowingly or unknowingly, Walt Disney has given us a parable of this inversion of creation order. I don't know if you remember what happened in the movie Next, than the clip I showed you, but they go play croquet with the long flamingo rackets. Uh, You remember that? And do you remember what happens when they're playing croquet? There's, There's another figure that shows up in the movie, and the woman, the Queen of Hearts, is made a mockery of by who? Cheshire Cat. The cat comes along and makes a mockery of the woman. And again, here is this picture, this animal exercising authority over the woman while the man passively watches from the sidelines. But now, take all of that and let's go back to Egypt and look what's happening here with the remnant of Judah. Look at verse 15 of chapter 44. Then all of the men who knew that their wives had made offerings to other gods and all the women who stood by a great assembly. It turns out that the queen of heaven, as she was worshiped in Egypt, is a picture of exactly what happened in the garden in Genesis chapter three. You've got the women who are taking charge of the spiritual life and vitality of the remnant and they're actively making offerings to this goddess while their husbands are watching. Nobody's speaking up. Nobody's pointing to the error. Nobody's saying, did you guys not hear what what Jeremiah said, this is bad news. This is a bad pathway. We should not be doing this. No husbands are taking responsibility for the spiritual health of their families. Might I offer the suggestion today that one of the great problems in our nation is that husbands are not taking control of the spiritual health of their families. They're so committed to it that the very next verse says this. I'm glad these aren't my words. As for the word you have spoken to us, Jeremiah, in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. It's one thing to think it, but to say it out loud, we will not listen to you. You spoke it in the name of the Lord. They're acknowledging that these are the words of God. We don't care what God says. We're not going to listen to you. What in the world could be the motivation for this kind of rebellion and obstinance? Well, it turns out that this remnant has bought into the very corrupting influence of this idolatry. And the remnant has embraced the greatest lie of idolatry. They wrongly believe that the queen of heaven was giving them what they wanted. They wrongly attribute the goodness of God to the activity of an idol. And then it says in verse 17, when they were worshiping the queen of heaven, they had plenty of food. They prospered. They saw no trouble, no disaster. They believed that the prophet Jeremiah was running around condemning the one thing that was satisfying their deepest urges. If you need more evidence about how corrupt this remnant has become from creation order, look at verse 19. The women said, we made offerings to the queen of heaven. We poured out drink offerings to her. Was it without our husband's approval that we made cakes for her, bearing her image, and poured out drink offerings to her? 